What have you done here? Uh, well, you're gonna have to taste it. it. Smells dusty. It's a little. It's a little dusty. Then again, I am dusty. <laughs> everybody to another episode of this is my bourbon podcast i'm perry i'm your host i am so excited that you guys are here with me this week and i'm also excited to have two brand new special guests on the show cj cunningham and nate taylor good friends of mine and also one of them is my boss basically (laughs) Uh, i don't know if i would say that he's uh or uh i guess more or less i am uh well, in charge of me, I mean, yeah. to some degree. Yeah, very, very slightly, a couple days a month, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah. CJ uh, uh, works with us too. I do. I yeah, do. we we uh, work, of course, for Nate at the Bottled and Bond Tours uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. We take people around. Has the name changed already? Yeah, yeah. No, oh, I'm has. sorry. No, it's it's okay. It will, well, it's, we're all in a transition. You know, oh. it's it, this year, this whole year, we just called it a transitional year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Bottled and Bond was the original name, uh, but we decided to move on to uh things beyond bourbon you know yeah and so such a bourbon specific name just didn't fit the the vision of the future so we decided to move it over and it will now be called distilled experiences which gives us a little bit of a broader look at it well shows how much i actually uh, have been involved with the company in the past six months you're fired by the way (laughs) great yeah we're gonna have a conversation after this oh fantastic yeah but i Super happy to, to have these guys on, and so glad that you guys are tuning in for another week, of course. We're going to be chatting about the tour company itself, as well as some different experiences that you can have on the Bourbon Trail, and why that's so much fun and so cool and all that good stuff. But first off, we have Flying Blind, and this week has been provided by CJ. CJ, it smells and tastes dusty. <laughs> it is dusty. As I told you, I am dusty, so my sample is is dusty. That didn't come out right. <laughs> okay, I'm, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and make a guess. Okay, let's have it. Is it a Jim Beam decanter? It is not a Jim Beam decanter. All right, I'm gonna cut that out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's gonna guess until it's right. First Oh, yeah! I told you, I'm I'm great at this. <laughs> I will tell you if you've seen any of my um, football season specific shenanigans, um, then you mm. may be able to guess what this is. The only thing that I'm certain of when it comes to CJ's football season shenanigans is that he ends up without a shirt on far too frequently. Yeah. Yeah, it's a problem. Win or lose. (laughs) (laughs) It's always a party. This is really good, though. I like this quite a bit. This is is my favorite, and I will tell you, I I ran across this kind of by accident because I was going for something for a specific year. So I bought it because of the year it was it was bottled. And I've spoken with people even older than me. There are a few out there that are just like, oh, man, that, I remember that stuff. That was junk. Um, but y- you know how a lot of the, the dusty stuff is now. It, it has just a very different, a di- very different nose, very different taste. And I, if this was junk back then, I wish I had started drinking when I was fourteen, I the you saying that kind of makes me think that it's a turkey product. It's because that's what a lot of people say about turkey. But now you're making the face indicating that it's it, not. It's so. it's not. It's not. You you may not get this. So I mean, do you want do you want any kind of hints, or are we just going to go around with this for a while? I feel or? like it's best if we don't have hints. Okay. All right. yeah. What do you think, mate? Well, I'm just going to keep drinking then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I my really my first uh, my first thought on this was something something four roses, uh, only because it really just seems to me that it's got a it's got a rye content to it because you can really you, the earthiness kind of shines through a bit on it and so uh, with the high rye contents that we know that four roses produces it was now does <clears throat> anyone else I mean do you get any butterscotch from that I kind of 
quickly in the middle of the palate. Yeah. So that was the, the first nose. thing that hit me on that. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely get it on the nose. Yeah. Yeah, and I, that's probably why. And I pay probably more attention to the nose than anything. I mean, that's why, you know, <clears throat> a lot of people know I love Old Forster Birthday Bourbon. Mm-hmm. I just think yeah, it has do. the most unique nose. And, you know, so that kind of attracted me to this, too. But it also uh, makes for a great celebration. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> Is he trying to throw? <laughs> is he trying to throw low key hints at us? I'm right trying now? to throw some hints, man. What if I give you um, a year? You want a year? A year might help, maybe. Yeah, that's fair, and it's probably general enough where it doesn't give anything away. Yeah. So it was bottled in 1986. So a couple of things happened in 1986 in in my world. I graduated high school, um, and the Challenger blew up but Mm. that wasn't really related to this at all but it was also the last time we beat the university of florida in football right when i say we for those of you that don't live in kentucky i'm a kentucky fan some people have been privy to my celebration after we beat them this year because I accidentally posted it on my public Facebook page. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. I remember that yeah. now. <laughs> That's when I, I got the text from my sister in California going, um, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> like, I'm celebrating. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. This isn't in my clothes group. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so uh, so there's there's your hint. If If you've seen that video and... I don't know. I've, it's been a it's been a while. Yeah, it was a blur for me too. <laughs> <laughs> I am stumped on this one. Okay, it is a it's a National Distillers product. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it is it is Bourbon Deluxe. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Never. I don't think I ever would have gotten that. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, think, which is why I was kind of flopping around. Well, you know, when I found it to. Uh, I bought it. It was actually an export, and and I bought it from overseas. Uh, honestly, you know, a lot of people that I know think I know a lot about bourbon, and compared to a lot of people we want we we run with, I really don't. I had never heard of Bourbon Deluxe. Yeah, you know, but I was. It's it was from 1986. I was convinced that we were finally going to beat Florida. Which I had been convinced of the previous 30 years, too. <laughs> um, but I was just like, it's going to happen, and I, I want something to pop open that night, and and it did. And I did. <laughs> it did, and you it did. did and it did. Everybody yeah. knows it now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> the, I picked that up, and it's kind of, you know, I got another 86 bottle I haven't opened yet. It's an old JTS Brown, which I think think is pre-fire heaven hill yeah yeah so um, you know now we all spend a lot of money on bourbon more than we should but i'm i'm more apt to spend money on older stuff than than newer stuff now just because it just seems to have so much more to it yeah Yeah. i agree i'm the same way with picks too Mm -hmm. i mean i'd I'd much rather have a really good russell's pick Mm -hmm. than (laughs) or two bottles of it, mm-hmm. then throw down, you know, a hundred dollars for even a Blanton's. Well, the reality is, is that I always think that when it comes to private picks, that's the, that's the real, uh, you know, the most beautiful thing that's going on in the bourbon industry right now, because it's giving people access to unique flavor profiles and characteristics that you used to have to pay premium prices to get to. Uh, and now you're getting an opportunity to taste those at, at a price that's accessible to anybody. And so I, I always say that to people is that, uh, you know, especially on the tours or other people that I interact with, especially when I'm maybe doing tastings in other states, uh, constantly they're talking about uh, large brands that they can't get a hold of anymore and how in the world could I find a way to help them, you know, get access to those again. And, and in the reality, I always immediately say, why are you worried about that product? How to get that you have some kind of, um, you know, kind of care for that product line but the reality is is that you could go out there and find private barrel selections that will uh, provide you with just as good a flavor profile if not better at some of those thank you for bringing that though hey it was really yeah, good it was good I, I, I haven't had that maybe only a couple pours of bourbon deluxe ever so this i I'm, i was probably oh. far worse off than perry was at guessing <laughs> on this one i have i have a a handle of bourbon deluxe from when it was 
then to produced by by Jim Beam. Right. And it's sitting behind the bar behind me, and I don't I don't ever really touch it. But it's where is it exactly? Well, it's in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> you go for it all yeah. you want. Talk man. to me on break. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, as we move on to our next pour, I have to ask you guys, as we do every week, what have you been drinking recently? Probably more than anything, and and Nate kind of foreshadowed this, um, Knob Creek Picks. Heck yeah. And, um, you know, between, uh, there's been a couple of picks I've been involved in, Uh, there's been a couple of picks, people we know that have been involved in, 15-year Knob Creek Picks, 50 bucks a bottle. And it's just really good stuff. So probably, uh, and I uh, also had someone gift me a, a, a pick from the Frankfurt Bourbon Society. I'd never oh, tasted nice. it before. And man, it was really good. So uh, probably more Knob Creek uh, uh, bottle picks, barrel picks so, than, than anything at this point. Yeah, I, th- I think that private picks have been have, have been the, the most frequent pour for me as well. Uh, I... I had just gotten the, the absolute pleasure the last couple of years to to be able to uh, host uh, some some groups that come from the D.C. Maryland area, uh, like uh, 1789B, which is a, a pretty famous group when it comes to, to picking barrels. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been really fortunate to be able to work with those guys, as well as like the Annapolis Whiskey Society, and uh, and so usually part of the deal is is that when they come down. They make sure that I get one pick of each thing that they that they put together, and so I just got a care package in about a week ago, and I opened one of the bottles and I meant to bring it tonight, but I was kind of rushed out the door because we just finished up a tour today, um, and so really what happened was is that I ended up with something I didn't mean to bring, but uh, <laughs> you know, apple pie moonshine from down in uh, eastern Tennessee. There's nothing wrong with that as, as a nightcap. Yeah, turn boy, uh, turn off his yeah. light. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but uh, but either way, it's 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 been a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of that. Um, especially they have a they have a couple uh, Barton picks that I've gotten, and I, I'm I'm usually not a massive fan of of, of Barton products. Uh, not that I I dislike them. I really like their secondary age stuff. A lot of times their yeah. their picks can can fall a little short for me. But uh, a couple of them that they pulled out, uh, especially from the Annapolis Whiskey Society, were. Were really fabulous, and so that's what's what I've, I've I've had in my glass lately. Yeah, 1792 picks seem to be way more favorable than <laughs> any of their standard offerings. Which, well, uh, I mean, <clears throat> there some I've had some amazing foolproof picks recently. Yeah, um, and um, I, I probably own more foolproof picks than any other, you know, line. I'm I'm that way with uh, Russell's picks. Russell's and Knob Creek single barrels, for sure. Well, those those Russell's picks and uh, the Knob Creek single barrel, uh, those picks, those are, man, I'm telling you, some of the best over and over and over again. I mean, they constantly come out and produce fantastic picks, and and Russell's for sure, because as as I know that you all know, and and many of our listeners know, uh, Wild Turkey is probably the most generous when it comes to picking barrels. Yes, Eddie completely wrecked one of my days <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a complaint that. <laughs> that's not a complaint but i i was glad i was not driving that day <laughs> and it was cold he was just like you want to try another and we were all just like yep <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i was that way one day after a buffalo trace pick it was for a liquor barn and you know how liquor barn does their picks they do like a massive amount of them all at one yeah. time we picked six different barrels from 18 total barrels Oof. and tried each of them at barrel proof <laughs> and at bottle proof. Oh my gosh. So that's 36 <laughs> individual bourbons in one afternoon. I had to sit down on one of the barrels at one point. <laughs> I looked up at Brad and I was like, I'm sorry, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I like these, but <laughs> I can't be sure. They, he's, that's he's when like, they start taking. Yeah, yeah, he's like, go back and reference your notes, and it just looks like a, you know, like some oh, kind of crazy scratch, schizophrenic the kid just like ran across the whole. Uh, that's the whole it, thing. that's what I always do. Is like it starts out being really like eloquent and everything, and by the yeah. end, it's like good. 
bad. Yeah. Could be better. I don't know. <laughs> and right. you, you lose your your uh, your will to fight for a pick too. Because you know? <laughs> yeah, at that point absolutely. you're just like, if that's what you're voting for, dude, let's just do that one. <laughs> been there <laughs> <laughs> so i uh, we just poured this kentucky owl confiscated oh i haven't said what i've been drinking uh, a couple of things that are really interesting so when we were in south carolina this past week for vacation we just happened to uh be in the pool with a guy who owns a couple of different breweries one is ancient city which is down in florida but the other one is uh the macro side of what he calls his life and it's called salt life and it's uh, uh what they're calling the rebirth of the american lager and picked up a six-pack of it on the way out of town it's really good <laughs> now we're really, really freaking good you say you were in charleston yeah we were in isle of palms <clears throat> oh okay yeah, yeah yeah um just be be careful the ground you're treading on because uh there's no bigger connoisseur of of charleston south carolina than this man oh so no. on the side of the um, room here borderline uh, this is how much i like charleston i actually watch on purpose a show called southern charm (laughs) so yeah i don't do reality tv but i watch that just so i can go oh i've been there or hey we need to try that place the next time we go down there but that that city man that city has my heart it's a it's a a lot of fun down there i do love it Yeah. yeah But so Salt Life Beer, which was really good. And then just last night, as of recording this, I was at the release party, quote unquote, I guess, for the Keeneland Makers Mark Private Select, which is now being sold to the public in bottles for the first time at the Keeneland Mercantile shop in Lexington. Go get a bottle. It's really good. We'll actually have some of it later on, too. I don't know if you guys have ever had it at Keeneland. Drinking bourbon at Keeneland is usually a hazy experience, <laughs> and to actually get to try this outside of Keeneland yeah. and sit down with it is really enjoyable. So we'll we'll try some of it. I, I do want to try that, and I, I don't I don't know what the rules are on this format, but I will say this: so I grew up on Maker's Mark. That's what yeah. got me into bourbon. I mean, my extremely inappropriate mother would ask me to make her bourbon and coke and of course i obliged and i would always sneak a little bit so i have a soft spot for makers but it's funny once you get to a certain level in this hobby it almost gets pushed aside Mm. and some of those private select things are extremely good extremely good yeah i think i think makers mark just because they have a uh just a lack of, of product overall on the market. I mean, people a lot of times will just uh, kind of downgrade the distillery because they're they're just assuming there's nothing out there that's beyond what the standard offerings have been for so long. Mm-hmm. And then they discount that. But you're exactly right. There are so many private selections out there, especially when we take like tours there and, and you get firsthand accounts from people right after the tasting. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, you'll ask them every time you'll say, you know, out of the five that you got there at Maker's Mark, what was your favorite? And time and time again, I'd say at almost like a 75% clip or higher, they're mentioning the private select at the very end of yeah. the tasting. Yeah. I'm definitely in the either private select or cast strength. Absolutely. Ballpark. Yeah. Because I think that both of those are fan- not to say that 46 isn't really good, not to say that the standard offering isn't good, but I think that there's something to be said about those higher proof weeded bourbons. Yeah, I think that's just fantastic. I think uh, for the uh, you guys know Iverson Griffin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah. so Iverson's a, a good buddy of mine, and Iverson um, was really the first person to introduce me to Maker's Mark uh, at a higher proof, and he would um, just speak volumes constantly about. He used to call it uh, Maker's Forty Six Cast Strength, which they don't actually you know sell it technically. Uh, but if you go there today, you can go and, and get the Bill Samuels Junior. Uh, private selection, which is Maker's 46 cast strength. Yep. And uh, it's an absolutely fabulous pour. Yeah, it is. That's been what we've been drinking. Guys, let's move on and talk about the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Yeah. And the awesome it. experiences that we get to have, not just as seeing people get to experience it on their own, but how much we enjoy it and why we wanted to, you know, be a part of all of this as well. Absolutely. So I think first, Nate, you would probably be the best one to talk about this. Is why did the the inspiration of the tour, 
why did the inspiration of the trail lead you to wanting to develop your own tour company? So my wife and I had just moved back to Lexington, and we uh, we just were looking for kind of quick work to get our feet settled below us again. And I had previously, um, a while back, had worked for BHG and Malone's and Drake's. Uh, they're off uh, Tate's Creek, Lansdowne. And uh, in, in when I so when I came back, uh, I had met up with some of the guys that uh, work in the corporate office there, and fantastic people up there at, at BHG and all of their companies. But uh, and, and they had mentioned, they said, well, why in the world um, don't you just come back here and work? And so uh, one guy by the name of Virgil uh, kind of brought me back in and he says, I need to really show you this place that we've put together since you've been gone. And uh, it's called OBC Kitchen. And I thought, OK, you know, I'll, I'm you know, familiar with it, <laughs> <laughs> as most people in Lexington are, I guess, at this point. Um, but, uh, he said, you know, let me, let me show you this place. So we, we, uh, we went down there and we checked it out. Uh, and I'm telling you the first time I walked through those doors, uh, I really didn't know much about bourbon at that point. I knew a little bit about it, but I was more of a cocktail guy. And, uh, I walked through the doors and it was just a, a shock and awe moment. And it was long before they did the extension, right? It, so it was just the one room. Right. And I mean, the bourbon on that wall just dominated the room and it, and it was a, and it was a, it was a great experience, uh, kind of getting to explore the space. And so I decided that I would come on as a bartender there again. And then, so, uh, basically what I, what I was doing is we were bartending pretty often and, uh, and I had lots and lots of people that would come into the bar and as any decent bartender would do, you kind of try to get to know some people that were sitting there, especially whenever it, it was a slower pace like it is at OBC. And so, so many of the people that we were seeing uh, were literally coming in and they're saying, oh, well, we're out here on the bourbon trail. We're going to go see some distilleries. We come from oh, so-and-so place. And I thought, oh, that's, that's, a great, you know, that's a great thing to do to come to Kentucky and see the bourbon trail. Uh, but what I started to notice was is that I would ask, well, who's taking you? Because in my mind, I'm thinking if somebody's going to three or four distilleries in a day and they're going to do the tastings like any sane person would do if they drove <laughs> all the way to a distillery, uh, how in the world are they driving around safely? And uh, you know, as just a concerned citizen of my community, I don't want a bunch of drunk people running around the back roads of Versailles, uh, especially because if anybody's ever been out there, the roads are not super yeah, straight. Not good. Right? No, no. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so either way, I, uh, I, I just started inquiring and I found out rather quickly there wasn't any true established tour companies here in Lexington that were taking people out um, and I have always been a bit of a historian and, and loved that aspect of it and so I thought well maybe some people might be interested in in learning about it plus having a, a DD basically and so I just uh, decided that we would take it from there we'd uh, we'd get a vehicle and we'd try it out and so we just kind of took it off we it was very much uh, one of those uh, leap forwards because I, I was taught growing up my grandfather used to say that you had to uh, if you ever if you ever started a business and you had one foot in and one foot out uh, you'd never be successful really because uh, there'd always be reasons that you could back out of it and so we actually bought the vehicle before we ever even started the company and so uh, and so that was kind of a force right it was a force that drove us um, forward and so after that it just developed over time and, and we kind of I've always let the guests um, be the ones that kind of dictate the way that we move uh, via reviews and just uh, talking with them and finding out about their experiences and trying to develop that way I think that's when one of the things that kind of excited me about wanting to come and do this with you is you know not just the fact that I got to go to all these beautiful places and, and, you know, regularly go visit Buffalo Trace, which is like, you know, second home almost to me. And even some places that I maybe hadn't been to in a long time and got to revisit, but just seeing kind of like the joy and the excitement for getting to experience something that I identify with as so much of my Kentucky heritage, you know, that I, I am, always excited and interested in sharing that around and just kind of getting to do that is really cool. Absolutely. But, yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, when I got into it, honestly, I was sitting at the bar at OBC and you and I were chatting and you were talking about what you did and me being who I am. I was like, oh, that sounds cool. <laughs> I think I want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've only been a mortgage professional for 25 years, but, you know, I come from kind of a, a different angle with this. I grew up in Frankfurt when Buffalo Trace was the ancient age distillery, yeah. 
And I just have some deep seated feelings about that community anyway. And I had grown to love bourbon, borderline obsessed with it. And, uh, I was like, man, that sounds like fun. And I can't remember the exact conversation, but I kind of got the feeling that you didn't get a whole lot of days off. Right? right, right. And I was just like, well, yeah, I can do this. My biggest fear in the whole thing was driving the bus. I remember I re- that. Yeah, I remember it was just like, well, you got to teach me how to drive this bus. And yeah. I think we were going to go to a church parking lot. Absolutely. And then we decided maybe that wasn't the best thing to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was I was going to teach you how to drive the bus like a like a 14-year-old in a, in a back yeah. church parking yeah. lot. Yeah, it was going to be fun. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so I kind of, on a whim, sought him out for that and still didn't know what to expect until the first time I did it. And... I, I was hooked because there's a lot of things. We all like bourbon. We like drinking bourbon. But I'm a huge history fan, just like you are. Yeah. And you take a place like Buffalo Trace is just steeped in U.S. history, much less bourbon history, Absolutely, right? Yeah. And then you go in there, and, and my favorite thing to do with people there is, you know, uh, and, and they run a good operation there. They, they make the tour buses come park along the side of Warehouse C. Mm-hmm. So... You know, my first experience there of just swinging those bus doors open and that smell from Warehouse C hit you. And I mean, it was, I love it anyway, but I mean, it was like my childhood, you know, came up through those doors and I was just like, oh yeah, I like this. And then, you know, we've all met each other because of bourbon. You see these people having fun because of bourbon and, um, it's just real easy to get lost in that. And the people just have a blast. It's real, it's real easy to not suck at being a bourbon tour guide. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because the people are just, you know, they just want to talk to you about bourbon. If you can kind of hold that conversation, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a blast. Absolutely. So what I really asked you here for, Nate, was for you to do an evaluation of the both of us. And <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect because I actually brought a uh, eighteen sheet uh, evaluation of the both of you that I was expecting to go through line by line. Uh, can I come clean about one thing here? Like the first six tours that I did for you, I had to just make up a number for mileage because I would always forget to fill out that damn form. I was just like, I don't know. I feel like uh, maybe we went ninety miles, so I'm gonna put ninety. <laughs> What's so interesting about that form is that I created a form. Uh, I don't but, know anything about this. But I absolutely hate the form. <laughs> I'm like, I'm the one that did this to myself, and, and I live with it. You know, it's a, it's a terrible situation. But, uh, but yeah, you know, the only reason why you don't know about it, Perry, is because you have yet to take the bus out, right? Oh, You're not okay. driven the bus. So yeah. there's really, yeah, you know, when you do, yeah, when not you do small, it, yeah. <laughs> He sticks with the, the small private He's king stuff, of the private right? tours. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He is. He does Which, a great job with them. Uh, you know, I've done a few of Thanks, those Nate. too, and those those are a blast because they're just yeah. so intimate. You yeah. Know? Uh, but I have fun on the bus because inevitably there's always somebody from Columbus on the bus, and I get to make fun <laughs> of Ohio State. It's perfect. <laughs> I tell you what, out of all of the states in the in the whole continental U.S., there is no one uh, that we tour more than the, the people from Ohio, and uh, and there is no one that I know that CJ loves to rag on more than the people of Ohio. I love so. it, and if there's a Michigan fan on there too, I just I love to pit them against each other. It's a blast. Wow, man, <laughs> you're really going yeah. for the jugular yeah, there. I take it personal. <laughs> I think that the trail itself, though, just lends itself to maybe not being a a lover of bourbon, but just, I think kind of at its base, a, a, a really big appreciator of what bourbon is Absolutely. and has done for not just Kentucky, but for the United States. And there's just something so cool to do in that step back and look at the way that this has grown so much, not just since the bourbon boom, but, you know, over the past 10, 15 years. I mean, when the trail started, there were six distilleries on the tour. Man. There's 16 now. (laughs) It's a world of difference. Yeah. It it is. It's like a hundreds of mile long commercial for Kentucky. Uh, But it's always interesting. Um to listen to someone like Freddie Johnson talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Because 
you know, I picture a time I wasn't around for it or I was, but I wasn't really into bourbon at the time. Like, I picture probably some people at Buffalo Trace or Ancient Age, whatever it was at that time, going, man, I I don't know if we're going to make it. Yeah. You know, yeah, people absolutely. aren't buying bourbon. Yeah. You know, all, all of these skirts are out here buying vodka and no one wants the brown water. Seriously, though, I mean, you think about where... Kentucky's economy must have been at that time and and places like Wild Turkey where Jimmy's been there for 60, 60 years. years. 60 I years, mean, what yeah. did he see at some point? He at some point he had to look at his wife and go, "Honey, I I don't know if it's going to work." You know, but uh, but now look at him. I mean, just 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 riding high and it's such a such a fun experience to watch people see that for the first time. And and for the, the industry to have gone from that surplus to a few years ago of an absolute shortage of everything that people were buying. I mean, I think that just at a, from a numbers perspective is a true testament to the absolute love for bourbon that is really thriving right now. And, you know, Nate, you and I had this conversation a few weeks ago now about whether or not we see the bourbon boom ending anytime mm. soon. I just I just don't see it happening. And, and and it's not even and it's not even just from a domestic standpoint. You know, I'm I'm blessed enough to speak with uh, you know, high authority figures at, at these different distilleries quite often. And so many of them tell me that the boom's not going to stop, and and all of these uh, these companies they have coming in doing these projections are telling them that it's you know it's still got another forty years of growth ahead of it and stuff like that. But you know I've never gotten any explanation beyond that until about a about three or four weeks ago, uh, I had uh, a distillery tell me that the reason why they don't expect it to stop is not because of the domestic market; it's because the markets in places like China and India are growing at such an insanely rapid pace right. that those alone will bankroll the the growth uh, in the coming years without even anything that has to do with our domestic market. Yeah. I'm, <clears throat> if I had to live in China or India, I would drink so much bourbon. <laughs> you want to know a fun <laughs> fact about that? I think You can uh, edit that. The, la- no. the, the last time that I looked, I believe the f- top two... Uh, whiskeys consumed in the world are both India-based whiskeys. Really, the top two in the world are the, are, are from India, and a lot of and that throws a lot of people off because they think of things like Jack Daniels as a whiskey that, that's highly consumed. But as you can imagine, uh, um, people in, there's a ton of people in India. First off, and and when I was there, I can tell you what that they don't drink anything but whiskey when it comes to alcohol it's just it's just really? a, a, yeah absolutely and and so i was really shocked by that almost anywhere you went there was, there was nothing clear uh you know you saw a little bit of rum and you saw a little bit of other other spirits but it was predominantly whiskey everywhere you went and if you can imagine you're pretty spot on when you say that if you lived in a place like india you might want to drink <laughs> a little bit uh because after i saw about the thousandth person uh take a take a a, a, a nice restroom break uh on the side of the road i realized that i would need it to be a little bit buzz to get through this life i think if i was if i was there full time you sure you weren't in san francisco <laughs> wow <laughs> we are we are dogging on all of it right now i'm sorry hey my sister lives in san francisco I've, i'm just having a little bit of fun i'm yeah, wondering how uh, many listeners i'm gonna lose after this episode <laughs> you have got the wrong guys on this podcast right now i'm gonna tell you what and, and we're we're only a drink and a half into this thing you get us about a couple yeah. more down and we're we're uh, probably gonna ruin okay you. i will i'll stop <laughs> By the way, something before we before we move on, I, I know that we're about to move on to the next pour here, but I, I wanted to. You guys made a, a great point. Uh, uh, someone was talking about Freddie Johnson a little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah, CJ. So, um, so I actually just saw Freddie today. It was the first time I'd seen him since I'd been back from vacation. And uh, man, the the. The smile on his face would light anybody's day up. Honestly, he's he's a, a fantastic human being. On top of being a great tour guide and an ambassador for Kentucky in, in the in the distillery of Buffalo Trace, but really, when I think of Freddie Johnson, he's probably uh, and you all would maybe agree with me that he's hands down the most famous, popular tour guide on the trail. Oh, easy, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, it's him and Bubba from Oh Bubba. <laughs> Bubba. Bubba's I'll tell you what, I get more. Because a lot of people we take on tours don't get Freddie. 
But a Correct, lot of yes. people get Bubba. Yeah. And Bubba has a very strong following. Yes, he but does. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, sure he, he absolutely does. Uh, but but Freddie, I think that when I, when, when I think about Freddie and what makes him such a popular guide and a popular person and, and a face uh, for a distillery, I don't really think it's so much about his vast knowledge of, of bourbon or anything like that. Uh, what makes Freddie so great is that Freddie is, is not afraid to be vulnerable enough to let his life story out there to everyone. And so, and, and he preaches this message of resilience in his family. You know, you think about his dad and, and his grandfather yeah. and the resilience that they, that they kind of went through. And not only just that, but the whole fact that the reason he even came back to the distillery was based based on a promise that he had made many years prior. And so what it does is he really, to me, embodies um, what Kentucky's all about. Uh, you know, as a whole, he, he kind of embodies that, but he also embodies uh, the kind of person that we all are trying to, to get to be. I mean, he, he's just a person that's just so bluntly honest about his life and, and he's okay with that and he's accepting of everyone else and they're accepting him. And so it, it really is about the connection that he's able to make with people, I think, more than it is about, about you know, any amount of knowledge or understanding that he has about the actual industry. Yeah, yeah. Have, have you ever run into Freddie without feeling better after you ran into him. Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely I mean, not. He, he is definitely that kind of guy. And the thing about people like Freddie, Jimmy Russell, you know, you might roll into Wild Turkey on a random Saturday morning and sit there and talk to him and his wife while she's doing the crosswords. Right. But what other industry can you do that? I mean, that would be like, hey, when he was alive, going to Apple and mm. just bumping into Steve Jobs yeah. in, in, the, uh, in the lobby and hanging out and talking. And you can do that... I've spent time with Bill Samuels. He'll sit and yeah. talk to you, uh, Bill Samuels Jr. As you know, as long as you want, just just really great people. In, right. In this, industry. that's really what it comes down to. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about too Al Young. Oh who, my gosh! Yeah. Who oh, for drops sure. drops in at uh, if I'm allowed to use business names. You know, he lives close to the summit, and he drops in at Whiskey Bear just randomly. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that's another person that I've never run into him where he didn't have time for me. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, that, that is unique. I mean, it's extremely unique. And, and all of those guys, uh, Fred, no, uh, I haven't had as much interaction with him, but when I have, it's been the same thing. And mm -hmm. all those guys know each other and talk to yeah. each other. Yeah. You know, you don't get that, uh, in, in other industries. So it's just, it's a fun thing to be around. I want to do a like a Legends of Bourbon episode mm -hmm. before Absolutely. Jimmy gets too old to be able to go out and do stuff and have like him and um, have Fred No up there too and Steve Nally who's now at Bartown Bourbon Company he yeah. used to be at yeah. Maker's Mark and um, just these you know big name guys who are kind of on their way out Jim Rutledge oh man too yeah. I yeah. mean it would just be so cool I mean. Not even from a podcast standpoint, but just to have all those people in the room, yeah, yeah, at the same time. And well, yeah, I mean, talk about a meeting of the minds uh, in that way. And 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 I think that the beauty of of things like this podcast, and if you in in being able to put something like that together, is that you really realize that these guys um, are really normal people. I yeah. mean, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people really kind of, you know, look at these master distillers or, or you know, or, or even any kind of a, a celebrity or, or face to a, a company. And, and so often they think, well, you know, they, they must live a different style of life or not be the kind of person that, that we are. Uh, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you uh, if you really think of bourbon and, and what it embodies, these people are the exact same way. They're, they're almost always very blue collar people that, that came up and worked through their system and they, you know, and they just, you know, grinded out and they had a passion for, for what they were doing. And that's all that really mattered. It wasn't so much like there was an end game. It wasn't like I'm trying to become a master distiller. It was more like a, I love bourbon mm -hmm. and I want to be in this industry. So if that means I'm a barrel roller or if that means that I'm a master distiller, it doesn't really matter as long as I'm part of this. And so that's what's really awesome. Well, the, I think the other thing, too, about Perry's idea about Legends of Bourbon is how real that is. Like, none of those guys would say, no, I don't have time for that. They would all say yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So we've now moved on to, this is our third, third pour. Third pour. Third pour. Can, third I, pour. can I say something? We never really talked about the confiscated. 
Uh, no, we did not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Let's let's actually back up and That's, talk about that. A yeah. Little bit. So, I think you know this. I, you probably know this too. I love OFBB birthday bourbon. Yeah. Um, but I of course I know. I sold you a bottle. <laughs> I know, but I. <laughs> I readily tell people, people on tours, because mm. you get this question every time, too. Hey, what's your favorite bourbon? Oh, all the time. Which yeah. is, you know, Ugh. I'm like, well, I really love Old Forest Birthday Bourbon, but I, I kind of... Kentucky Owl Rye, batch one, is the best whiskey I've had in two years. I just, I love it. That's saying a lot. Yeah, I mean, really? so... Um, I always that I'm, I I have a few bottles of that because I'm always afraid oh it's it's gonna go away forever but um, <clears throat> that and, and that's the whiskey that turned me on to rye because before I was like eh, I drink rye I drink bourbon yeah. I drink bourbon and I drink Kentucky bourbon you know uh, but uh, but Al Rye that first batch uh, the second batch to a degree but that that first batch is really good. The confiscated, I'm actually kind of surprised because for some reason I got kind of that that same feeling when I first drank that. I was just like, "Oh, wait a minute, um, I like that." Yeah, and I wasn't kind of, I was not expecting that from that. It's it, it turns out to be kind of a catch twenty two, if you're not careful. Yeah, you can really want to like it, but there's the price point. Mm-hmm. So right. you almost have to remove the price point from your equation of favorability but i had this exact conversation with dixon a couple months back where we talked about trying to remove yourself from that butt part of the uh, of that equation and just basing it solely on whether or not you liked it in breaking it down based on what's in your class and i've tried to kind of start mentally reassessing the the way that i drink bourbon or the way that i drink rye and just go, do I like it? Yes. What do I like about it? Or do I like it? No. What don't I like about it? And yeah, I mean, CJ, you listen to the show. Yeah, we do a review system where we have price as one of the deciding factors. But at the same time, you know, that is important. But I think that it, the price is kind of a culmination of everything else that goes into whether or not you like it or what you can find about it that you may like or dislike and everything. And I think that Kentucky Owl products are just kind of a, they're a really good example of that. I think they're all, I've not had a bad one and yes, they are pricey, but I think they're worth it. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, I know that, you know, especially the bourbons that let's say reach that or, uh, you know, kind of surpass that hundred dollar mark, a lot of times are really have a, that shock value original. Like as soon as you see it, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, $110 for this whiskey. Like what in the world and why would I buy that? Well, uh, well the, the thing really comes down to is that if you think about it, um, you know, 110 bucks sounds like a lot for a bottle of whiskey, but the reality is, is if you were to drink just a, a bottle of, of standard Buffalo Trace or Evan Williams single barrel, you could get up to that kind of a tab mark if you drank a bottle of that in a bar. Mm-hmm. And so the real oh, yeah. and so the the real reality of it is is that people are so willing to spend that money in ways that they don't directly see that dollar sign. Uh, but the reality is is they're spending that same amount of money in other avenues. Um, so for me, it's like uh, I, I'm much with you, Perry. It, it's it's more about the the actual pour itself and the experience you're having in the glass because if I'm really enjoying it, you know, bourbons over a hundred dollars can be, you know, it, it does not shape any difference. And I, and I know a lot of people that aren't, you know, very wealthy people that drink a hundred dollar bourbon. And well, the thing is, is they're not over there smashing a bottle a night. They're having, you know, a, a, a pour I, or two, true. right? True. You know, so that's the whole thing is that if you really respect of whiskey and, and you really want to, you know, take your time with it, enjoy it, you know, price point to a certain extent uh, shouldn't be the main determining factor. Uh, that's the reality of it and that a lot of people don't really follow. To that point, too, I mean, I, I view this as a sharing experience, too. Mm. So, yeah, I may have paid $110, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be consuming all $110 of this whiskey. Yeah. My inclination is always to, if I have something special like this, or I know that it's really good, 
Same thing goes for the the B Tech. <clears throat> I'll share it around. Yeah. I mean, I got through last year's. I mean, I still have a little bit, but I got through last year's stag way quicker than I had intended to, just because it was so good and yeah. I wanted so many people to try it. Yeah. But that's isn't that what it's about? I mean, so many, so many times you hear yeah, for that sure. that uh, you know a bottle of whiskey is not meant to be drank solo. You know, if you're drinking it solo, then there's other things that you need to be worried about, not, not drinking whiskey. Yeah. Well, and you know, you touched on this too, and <clears throat> I'll I'll bring this up because it's recent in my life, and I think it's relevant. It, I, if I'm sitting around the house at night, you know, I'll I'll have Buffalo Trace on the rocks, and yeah. I love it. It's yeah. good. Yeah. You know, recently my father passed away, and I had uh, three friends over, and they had also lost their father. It was Father's Day. I would have opened anything, and oh, we, absolutely. you know, we shared three, you know, expensive bottles. They all brought something, and. Uh, we were able through a very good friend who was generous. I got the uh, the Father's Day release uh, from the gift shop there at Four oh, Roses, yeah, yeah. Uh, which was really good, and uh, and that's where price goes out the window for me. Yeah, uh, that and then sometimes like I see that old Fitzgerald handle sitting over there. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. uh, I'm guessing what is that like seventy something. 60 something? Uh, no, I got this off, got that off the shelf. For oh, okay. 35. So, okay. <laughs> but if I had gotten well it secondary, done. yeah, it would yeah. have been like 70, 75. Yeah. So you, you know, some of that old fits, I'm, I've had an old fits from 1968. And I mean, I, I would fight somebody for that again. I mean, it was that good. Every once in a while, you run into something like that and you're like, well, I know it costs a lot, but occasionally I want to have that experience. Yeah. And, uh, so that and sharing it with friends is when price goes out the window. As far as the the Al products go, um, now that I've actually tried the confiscated, I'm more willing to pay what it cost. Yeah. Before you know, um, and I mentioned this, I'm still kind of a layman when it comes to a lot of this stuff, and I start thinking, I loved Al Rye Batch One. Um, uh, batch two was good, and now they're coming out with confiscated. Well, what are they doing here? Are they reaching for things? Is this gimmicky or whatever? And then I taste it, and I'm like, oh no, I would buy that. Yeah. You know? So, you know, the tough part is, is we can't try everything, you know, unless you have a successful podcast. Or you can go to OBC Kitchen. <laughs> or there OBC you go. Kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> We're really plugging them today. Uh, so, uh, really. I, I guess the biggest issue with these, with a, with a lot of these um, high price whiskeys, is that these days, because the market is becoming more and more oversaturated, you're getting so many people in the game that are just out for the cash grab, and they've got these gimmicky things that are, they're just running to try to to try to get people to spend a lot of money so they can make a lot of money really quickly. Mm-hmm. And I think that in a way that could have potentially, you know contributed to this issue that that kind of makes you skeptical as a real true bourbon drinker to just jump in on them because there's a lot of bourbons out there that are over 100 bucks or over 70 bucks or over 30 dollars they're not even worth uh you know half of that amount of money uh, just simply because they weren't a a well-crafted whiskey and on top of all of that uh, you know you just know that you're supporting the wrong kind of people because those kind of people are not here uh you know to help our communities they're not here to help our state they're here to help our industry mm-hmm. they're really just here to make a little money and then move on to the next project yeah and and i've seen that and i won't use a particular brand name because i don't want to do any damage to anybody <laughs> right. but you know you see stuff on the shelf and you're like i am not spending 180 dollars on that because i have no earthly idea what that's like exactly um but back to the point that particular bourbon i'm talking about i did get a sample from iverson at obc and and it was pretty good i was still not going to spend 180 bucks on it but at least then you get to make an informed decision uh but yeah there's a lot of that out there as yeah. well too yeah it, we've talked about this much about tours <laughs> oh i know that's okay that's <laughs> which is right. this is every bourbon conversation i've ever had well, it just yeah. goes down it, yeah there's so yeah. many avenues and yeah. i mean well I, I know we'll come back around to it too because it is Again, just part of the experience of drinking bourbon in this day and age, being able to be in Kentucky, you know, going to distilleries like we are able to. But this is an important part of it, too. (laughs) 
you know, yeah, being able absolutely. to just talk about what we're drinking and um, yeah. the experiences that we have with it and everything and, as well. And, and we've been lucky. The, the three of us have been very lucky um, in in the ways that we've been able to interact with the industry anyway. So, oh, you know, in, sure. in a way, maybe there, you know, there's some unique views that other people, you know, really haven't got to. There's, I mean, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, tour companies out there. There's not, well, you know, even if they're, you know, no matter how many tour companies there is, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the point is, is there's not a lot of people doing the things that we do. Uh, you know, we drink whiskey, but not a lot of people are going to distilleries day in and day out and interacting with the industry so often. So it really gives uh, – maybe our perspective might be slightly skewed compared to you know the average yeah. drinker day-to-day. Thank you, CJ, for bringing back up the confiscated. Sorry. But we did just pour this Keeneland Maker's Mark Private Select. I think it's really good. It is good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so I did not know this until uh, this event last night. Keeneland was the very first company to go to Maker's and do their own private select. Really? I had no idea. Not just that, but every time that they've done one, it's been the exact same combination of staves. Oh, I didn't that know that. they did for the first time. And nobody knows what it is. Interesting. They do not release that information. Oh, they don't the put public. that on the bottle? No. So, yeah, you they don't. They the stickers, the, the stickers so on there. Oh, well, they just don't mark it. They don't mark it. Interesting. Hmm. Well, when you when you go there, if you go there for a private pick, you know there's a that wall there on the side where that uh, they did all that blown glass on the side there, and you know they've etched every name into one of those like teardrops. It's like yeah, really, it's etched in, into each one. So every time someone does a pick, their name will be etched into one of those blown glass teardrops on the back. And I think that's the only reason why I knew Keeneland was the first one because I remember looking at it and going to the very first thing and seeing Keeneland there, and I thought that that was really just kind of an incredible thing. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's really interesting always. Uh, there in Four Roses does the same thing with the small um, stave pieces where they, mm-hmm. and they put the names in there. It's always so interesting to look at those boards because you'll realize that there's a lot of bars, a lot of liquor stores and restaurants that you've probably patronized at some point in your life that oh, yeah. come through there, and it's really interesting to, to kind of make that connection i don't know if jim beam still does it but they did that with the the knob creek picks they'd print extras of the the little chrome labels Mm -hmm. and when you're actually at the distillery doing the picks and you walk through the bottling line you look to the left and all of the different stickers the chrome plates Mm. are on the wall and so you just see them from all over the place and it's really that is cool it's really very very cool yeah what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Where was I? Where's oh, the, yeah. What are, we, what are we doing? Well, you know, speaking, of, uh, let's talk about some of those. You know, we're talking about tours. We're talking about experiences. <clears throat> there are a lot of these obvious ones that we hit every day. Um, but, you know, we haven't really talked about some of the new players. Um, yeah. And... I am. I have been fortunate. I've been on a couple of picks at New Riff, and lucky. Yeah, I got. I got to <laughs> tell you, that place puts together a really good experience. Yeah, um, and I wasn't expecting that because we get caught up in all the history of of bourbon, and then this new player comes along, and you know, New Riff. You know, I'm just like, oh, wait a minute. And I, well, actually, you drove the first pick we went yeah, up there. I remember I rem- that. I remember that. Yeah. And, and I wasn't sure what I was expecting, but I was very impressed. And I've been on another one since then. And, oh, by the way, on top of that, they're producing some really good whiskey. Yeah, it's really yeah they really amazing. are. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's young. So, I mean, you know, what are we going to be talking about when it's 8, you know, 10, 12 years? So, um, a lot of places like, like that uh wilderness trail um yeah absolutely. those kind of places and you know nate and i've talked about this because you can only do so much out of lexington even going to maker's mart can be a real challenge logistically on a tour uh but i think that next level and nate and i've talked about this a little bit is being able to get into some of those craft distilleries right and and building maybe custom experiences at some of those places so the the biggest one for me out of all of all of the new players has actually been one that's sitting on the table, Bardstown Bourbon Company. Mm. Not only have they been extremely gracious and and kind and welcoming to us and me in the podcast in general, but 
everything that they do there is a world class A plus five star experience. I mean, they absolutely do not skip out on anything. Agreed. They might not do barrel picks, but they make you feel like you're supposed to be family there. Yeah. And they will do any and everything to take care of you. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of those places, you know, um, uh, my significant other is from E-Town, Radcliffe, and we drive down that way quite a bit. And that's a place we see. And I'm like, I, I really want to get in and see that place. I want to try that restaurant, that kind of thing. She even got me a bottle of, of, of that for Father's Day. So um, uh, I, I hope when people listen to things like this, they will open themselves up to some of those other experiences. Because, you know, I went by... I think we had an uh, a one-off tour that had, that went by Luxro last year. Oh, right. I'd yeah. never been there before. Yeah. And I was like, holy crap, this is cool. You yeah, know? they do a fantastic job there, too. Yeah. Really, they do. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, in, in, in as you're mentioning, you know, Barstown Bourbon Company, uh, I've, I've been able to, to take a couple tours through there, and, and, uh, and, and it was really... Uh, before they've really gotten into developed as much as they are now. Uh, but what we would do is we would go through there and, and do as much as they would really allow us to do, but we'd always also make sure that we put in a, a meal there at, at Bottled and Bond. And, uh, man, they do a fantastic job mm-hmm. on that side. I mean, if you're really looking for a really good dinner, I mean, I know that that might be out there a bit, but, you know, I tell people constantly from this area that – a lot of people forget to explore your own neighborhoods, right? Mm-hmm. And so even if you're from Lexington or Louisville or anything like that, to just go down there to Bardstown and, and maybe stay a night at like at the old jailhouse or, or – or, Oh, I've or, done that. Right? I've That's that. so cool. I mean there's some really cool places. And by the way, Bardstown is, is one of the – the best small town. I mean, I think, I think it's been ranked in one of the best small towns mm-hmm. in America many times over. And uh, so, you know, go down there and, and try that place out. I mean, they they really do a world class job um, for especially for the fact that they're kind of in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, between a lot of you know the two big cities, and, and they don't get enough credit. Mm-hmm. I agree, man. This is a great maker select. It, it really, it really is. is. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I, I kind of get pissed at myself because you don't how, get more of them how, well how many bottles do i have laying around open that are really good that i forgot how good they are because yeah you know, we accumulate stuff and and then you open it and you're like oh wow i mm-hmm. forgot about that you remember that's bourbon and not Water. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have. That would have been really funny to see him take a massive <laughs> so swing when, back. Thinking when you're water pouring in into a quart sickle like this, you can't. You don't. I, I couldn't measure. So there's more in here if you want some more bourbon deluxe. How about I give you a dusty that I have? Okay, that's fine. This is a 1980 Wild Turkey Eight Year 101. Mm. Oh, I'm gonna like this. This was uh, from a decanter. And when I bought this, I, everybody who's listened to the show has heard this story. Um, I bought this thinking that I was getting the decanter with it. And so I was willing to pay what I did no. for it, thinking that I was getting the decanter with it. No. <laughs> My God, what's this mason jar? How does that happen? Who did that? Uh, what happens is I misread posts, and I'm oh just an my idiot. Okay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. While you're while you're pouring this fun story about a wild cur- uh, wild turkey decanter, uh, so my future brother in law and I were up in Detroit, and uh, and he is a he's a bourbon lover, um, but he he really is um, he's really untested in the waters of it all. Right, he's only ever drank the standard kind of stuff, uh, but he's interested in it. And so uh, I was up in Detroit, and, and him and I decided that we were going to go out and do some bourbon hunting one day around Detroit. And so we ended up, you know, going to a bunch of stores and believe it or not, there's a lot of really, you know, good kind of behind the scenes honey holes in Detroit. And uh, crazy enough is that we ended up in this um, kind of convenience store gas station combo that looks like that it was maybe built in the 50s or the 60s and I don't think it's been cleaned since the 50s (laughs) or the 60s. We walked in and I literally was like, 
we just need to leave. Like we didn't even, I was like, we just need to turn right around and get the heck out of here uh, because we're going to see nothing but barefoot cab and nothing else. And so I was like, <laughs> we didn't need to get out of here. And, but, uh, so he was like, oh, well, you know, I'll get a couple cans of uh, dip before, you know, we move on so that I can get through my day with you. I love and, how this story's going yeah. so far. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm like, oh God, okay, let's just do this. And so he goes and does that. And I'm just like looking around really quickly, not thinking a thing about it. I actually skip the whiskey bit for, a, for at first I go straight to the beer because there's actually quite a bit of good beer up there especially back then they had just released m43s and you know i just wanted to get a bunch for for myself and some of my buddies um but anyways i was looking around and out of nowhere there was one wall of, of a little bit of wine and above that it had um kind of like a shelf there was there was a separation between the top of it and and the ceiling and i saw uh, a box that looked like i was reading old crow on it and i thought Hold on, what is that up there? And so I asked for a step stool, and I get up on the step stool, and I move away a couple. They had um, some like uh, cars, not car decanters, but like just regular like model cars in the front. I move these model cars out of the way, and if you wouldn't guess it, there were four old crow nineteen, I think eighty three or seventy three. I can't remember off the top of my head. Decanters. Tax sealed, never touched since that then they had the shipment in originally to the space because when I asked the guy in the back, he said that he bought the the place and everything came as is and he had never touched anything from then. <laughs> so I get four of those down, realize they're all full tax strip sealed, and then beside them, believe it or not, there were another four wild cur- turkey decanter <laughs> oh sets gosh. from the, the the wildlife series, the mini wildlife series, and they were all Full tax strip sealed. I'm not even kidding with you. And if you and if you don't want to punch me already, I'll tell you that I got them for a stone cold ten dollars each. <laughs> I had to pay a little bit more of a premium for the old crow ones because they actually had stickers on them from the original one. So I had to pay. I can't remember how much it was. Maybe you know, seven dollars, fifty bucks, or something like that. But I, I got four of those Walter turkeys for like ten bucks, and I was like, I cannot believe what's happening right now. And I and I was literally, it was like I was, uh, I was just scared out of my mind that at any moment the guy in the behind is going to become a bourbon connoisseur and know what the heck he was doing. And <laughs> Wait so a minute, I let ran, me look that up on Google. Real he's going to track you down. Yeah. I and ran get the out biggest twelve gauge shotgun. Hour. Yeah, and I remember I brought that back. Uh, I brought one of them to uh, to Jimmy because we go to Wild Turkey so often. Uh, I and I, I knew I would see him, and so I just kept it around and and I took it into him one day when he was there. And uh, and he saw it, and there's something really, really special uh, when you when I brought that back because uh, he had he had made the product. Uh, he was very much behind the, the design and the style and the whole thing that they had going on. And so for him to, to see that again, and it's not like he doesn't see decanters as own home or, or, or around his office or sure. stuff like that. But for him to see something that was brought back from Detroit, it was something that he had crafted 30 or 40 years prior. Uh, he was just really all inspired. He took it out and he was looking around. He was telling me about the little details and it all came from this kind of like really, you know, slum hole in, in, in you know, middle nowhere Detroit that, that and it was packed in behind these models. <laughs> cars on a wine shelf and he asked you if you could have it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i said I'll, I'll trade you uh you know i just get to go to your house and pick what i want yeah exactly uh, that's what happens when you go to places other people are afraid to go but <laughs> that's uh, exactly it you're it, gambling with your life you either you either yeah. walk out with a wild turkey to cancer or a gunshot to the back well uh, for back a minute i felt like you were describing a scene from clerks like i felt like they were going to be playing <laughs> hockey on the roof or something but that's a, I had to get in my clerk's reference. Well, but, you know, that that does remind me real quick. I had bought one of the first uh, Four Roses single barrel bottles, and I got it from overseas. It was an export, and I got it because I liked the bottle. It was a different bottle. And then uh, I went to um, a charity thing for Lexington Bourbon Society, and um, Brent Elliott and Al Young were both there. And we brought that bottle, and we were – raffling off shots out of it you know everyone bought a ticket and if we pulled your ticket you you know you got to drink from it yeah and um unexpectedly al young went into a story like that and he was just like you know this was the first single barrel we actually produced and we didn't do it for the united states and he went into all this story then all of a sudden the raffle prices went up (laughs) but but it was but it but Uh, running into stuff like that is 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 really cool i like that 
Yeah, yeah. Those for those bourbon collectors out there, there's there's rarely a, a moment that's more special than something like that. It, it's way better than camping out uh, for for four days oh. waiting for a release. So CJ's making a face at me, by the way. Yeah, that, this this is insane. Yeah, it's really freaking good, dude. Yeah, for someone that didn't realize how much I like turkey until they started drinking old turkey. Uh-huh. I mean, just amazingly good now don't get me wrong i preach it all the time turkey 101 is my go-to it's my daily drinker but this is that cranked up to the Mm. max Mm. people give turkey no credit they really don't yeah i can't talk for a minute i can't talk for a minute (laughs) are you crying (laughs) the experience is overwhelming (laughs) cj (laughs) there is something about i don't know how to say it there's almost like a funk to a lot oh, of yeah. the older stuff. Oh, yeah. That, and, and, you know, at first I was just like, I don't know. But then once you drink it, it's just like, oh, man, that is just so good. What did they do back then? Like, what was different? There's the rumors that, you know, they didn't clean the pipes out as well as they do now. So there's just this buildup of some of the old funkiness from... Well, they need to quit cleaning pipes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know if the FDA is going to be okay with that. See, I, I said I wasn't going to go political, but this is what happens when government gets involved in stuff like that. <laughs> Hands off our bourbon. <laughs> oh, man. No, th- this is a great pour, and um, this is, I think, the oldest thing that I own right now. What year did you say this was? 1980. 80. Yeah, I was still alive. (laughs) So thank you for this because... Yeah, of course. I've had a lot of people talk about Dusty Turkey. I've had a lot of people talk about the Cheesy Gold Foil, which I've still never had. Yeah, that lives up to the hype. That was really, really good. It is, yeah. That's good to hear. Absolutely. Should we talk some more about the trail? I feel like we've... um... I feel like there are still experiences. I mean, I haven't gone a hundred percent of the way through the trail just yet, and I don't know if it's just that you know I haven't had the time or whatever. But like, I like that there's always kind of something that's a little bit out of reach or that I haven't quite gotten to experience yet. And even with the trail, there's something to be said about that too. And you're talking about, you know, pours that you haven't had yet, bottles that you haven't been able to experience yet. And I think that there's, there should be, in bourbon, something that you're always kind of looking forward to. Something that you want to move on to. Something that's a next step. And I feel like there is the potential for somebody to go to a distillery. And I won't name names because, you know, I have preferences. Other people have their preferences. But they'll go to a distillery... And they'll say, that was just not a great experience. It just wasn't for me. And then they get kind of turned off by it. If we had all had Benchmark (laughs) as our first bourbon (laughs) and then said, never mind, don't want to have any part of that, we would have missed out on so many things. We would have missed out on Dusty 1980 Wild Turkey 8 Year 101. But I, I think that my advice to people is to keep giving it chances. Even if you don't like the bourbon, there may be tours that you really like, or the scenery is really beautiful. There's so, I feel like there's something for everybody in bourbon trail tours, whether or not you're a bourbon aficionado or connoisseur or whatever. Yeah, I, so, <clears throat> you know, my significant other... We all, when we go on the tour, Nate has put together a great little piece that's on the back of your name tag, and it's a tasting wheel. And she'll look at me, and she'll be like, well, I don't see battery acid on there anywhere. <laughs> Aww. Uh, Aww. It, but, that, but I will tell you, no one loves to go look at Woodford Reserve more than she does. If you go to the property at Castle and Key and you sit by that waterfall and you sit by their, you know, their aquifer, um, uh, and, and several people that come on the tours, um, both men and women are with their significant others. And one of them doesn't have any interest at all in the bourbon, but they certainly appreciate driving by the horse farms. They appreciate, 
learning the history and and uh, you know they may or may not taste suburban at the end of it but that's a that's kind of a real weapon that the bourbon trail has is to get to these places you have to pass by some amazing countryside and everybody loves that and I, just to yeah. cut in real quick i think that's part of what you were saying is the commercial yeah for kentucky it's not just the bourbon it's everything that surrounds the bourbon and where it's produced right and i think one of the first things nate kind of trained me on or taught me when we were when he was telling me okay this is how the tour experience is is from the time you step on that bus everything that you see smell taste here is kentucky and <clears throat> the bourbon is a big part of that but the music we play on the bus right. you know the the horse farms that you drive by um the places we stop for lunch and the people that work in those places man that is kentucky because it, you want to you want to blow somebody away bring someone from long island on that bus oh my and gosh, let yeah. people let them experience the people of yeah. kentucky i mean they don't know what to think they're like holy crap is that is that real? Why are, are they, they so nice? Yeah, are they really that nice? Because, you know, why did they say no? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that that's a big part of the trail. I think what you're going to see going forward. I think with what Nate and and other companies want to do, and if you put me in charge of the Bourbon Trail, which I would have to question your business acumen, but <laughs> it is. They've, they've put together a great product. They have a great product to sell. But there is going to be people that are coming back the next year that want the next level. So, you know, is there a way to incorporate a barrel pick into a tour? Is there a way to, at the end of the tour, have a, a private tasting, you know, with one of our, our bar partners? Um, do we tie in with certain hotels or bed and breakfast to, you know, to create? And I think this is why Nate went from bottled in bond tours to distilled experiences, because we're not just going to be doing tours at this point. We're going to be creating experiences. And I, I have, you know, my sister lives in California. She works in the wine industry. I've been on a lot of wine tours. Uh, and people always enjoy them. But the big difference is at the end of some of these bourbon tours, I'll, I'll hear people from other states go, I could live here. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I love this place. And you don't necessarily get that in, in other places. And I think that's where, you know, we're just honestly blessed to be in a position yeah. to deliver that to people. And I, I think it's a great thing for the state and for the industry. I mean, just to add on to that, I, one thing that there's, there's very few things that I ever actually repeat on the tours. I'm, I'm pretty off the cuff constantly. Um, but the, one of the things that I do repeat quite often is, is at the very end, I tell people that, you know, I, first off, I genuinely hope they had a good time and, and I absolutely put my best foot forward to make sure that was the case. But more than more than anything, I tell them that, you know, I hope you enjoy the tour. But what this is all about is that I just want you to fall in love with Kentucky. It, it's bigger than just bourbon, even though the bourbon is probably really the reason they bought the ticket or they wanted to come out here with us. Uh, the reality is it's, it's much larger than that because Kentucky is is bigger than just bourbon. It's bigger than just horses. Uh, and we've said it time and time again already. Uh, it's so much about the people and the culture that we have here. And it's really intoxicating if you let it be, uh, and, you know, and to tie it kind of back to, to kind of what Perry was saying so many times, uh, when people visit distilleries, especially local folks, they visit them, they find their favorite. And then it's almost like they pigeonhole themselves. It's like, I can only enjoy this distillery or this product. Like this is my product. Well, you know, you should try to open your mind a little bit because you're going to find these distilleries like new riff, and like Lux Row and, and Barstown Bourbon Company that are really doing great things out there that can provide different experiences that you're not getting somewhere else. Uh, but not only just that, um, you know, you got to open your mind to the fact that Kentucky is just um, 
it's just a fantastic state that offers so much um, that that even the local people uh, more than likely have not really explored it the way that they should. Um, and and so often you get people that, that, that really close their mind up in, in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to brands mm-hmm. and things like that. And they, and they really, you know, they're really just, uh, you know, taking away their own opportunity to experience some really cool stuff. I can't yeah. say that I'm not guilty of that either. I mean, I was saying at the top of the episode, I go to Buffalo Trace and I feel like I'm coming home. You know, it's just kind of a safe spot. I know yeah. what it's like. I know the people there. Yeah. I I get to interact with familiar folks. But yeah, I mean, I do want to go and expand my experiences. We haven't even talked about the fact that there's an entirely different bourbon trail tour to go on, which is the craft trail. Yeah, yeah. That's another different Whole aspect. Thing, yeah. And I mean, they're at 20 different distilleries now. <laughs> That's crazy. And they'll keep growing. And there's some great stops on there, too. Wilderness Trail. We've already mm-hmm. talked about New Riffs on there. Limestone Branches on there. Will, Will it? it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's so many awesome places to go. But if you just have this really narrow view of what you can or can't do, you're going to miss out on so many different experiences, so many different opportunities yeah. that yeah. are out there. And I would even encourage people to not just go on... The Kentucky Bourbon Trail, there's a Tennessee Whiskey Trail now, too, which is really cool. I like that there's... <laughs> this... <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, I like that there's the expansion of it. I like yeah. that it's, you know, now whiskey is now becoming so popular across the United States that there are enough distilleries and enough experiences to be had where something like the Kentucky Bourbon Trail can be, to a degree, replicated, or it can be... You know, it, people are see it and they go, "I want that. Yeah. I want to be a part of that." Yeah, and I have, I have no problem with the Tennessee whiskey trip. Um, but <laughs> look, all that comes from me hating Tennessee football. It has nothing to do. With it. I will say okay. this: I flew back from Florida this week. Allegiant Airlines, God love them, only carries Jack Daniels. <clears throat> and I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah that's true. They, really. they have zero bourbon. That's the only whiskey they carry, and. Uh, you know, out of necessity, I drink it, and um, quite ashamedly, I did not hate it. You know, it's different. It's different. They don't have to put Tennessee on the label, but, you know, um, uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It, <laughs> it, it, it was fine. And, you know, um, I've talked to people that have gone down to that tour at Jack Daniels. I, I haven't done it, and they really enjoyed it outside of the fact that they have to go to another place to actually buy because right. only Tennessee would build a distillery in a dry county. <laughs> hey, Nashville, world class, man. I love that joint. Absolutely. I love that joint. And Knoxville is also a city. It's also a city. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> hey, I tell you, I tell you what, another another a cool city in Tennessee um, that a lot of a lot of people haven't given a lot of credit to in a while. Chattanooga. I love Chattanooga. Chattanooga is oh, a cool now, city. Chattanooga whiskey is producing some really good stuff. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. 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 Their yeah. gas strength is pretty daggum good too. Yeah. And you want to know uh, a fun fact I found out today? Uh, What's that? Not really a fact, I guess. Uh, but uh, Castle and Key is uh, putting together their yearly cocktail events tomorrow. Um, and so they, they had 70 submissions. I was there today and they were telling me a little bit about it. They had 70 submissions, uh, and they chose from 10 or or chose 10 out of the 70. And out of those 10, two of them are from Chattanooga bars. Wow. So, um, so it, it, it sounds, and and I asked them a little bit about it and they said that, that whiskey and, and, you know, even though that we know Castle and Kia is, is producing vodka and gin only right now, and that's really what it's about. But the cocktail, um, that they put out was, it was kind of based under the scenario that it needed to be kind of a riff on a classic. And so it didn't have to technically be vodka gin or it could have been whiskey. It didn't have to be their product technically. Um, but two of those were coming from Chattanooga bars and they really were talking about how um, you know that this this whiskey revolution, this this whole uh, you know crafting farm to table revolution is really taking hold now in Chattanooga. And I already thought it was a cool city and when I was there a couple of years ago. Uh, I went down to watch Elton John in, in Chattanooga. Nice, yeah, That's right, awesome. yeah. He was pretty good, and uh, <laughs> and so and so I got to explore the the town a bit there, and, uh, and and so it's really nice to see that they're they're coming along really yeah. well down there. Yeah. 
That's a good point. Nate, what did you bring for us to try? I'm dead serious when I say that I got off that tour and I was already 10 minutes late out the door and I literally uh, pulled the first bottle that I literally saw and that was a bottle of apple pine moonshine. If you think I'm kidding, I'm not kidding. And and here's a fun story about it. Here's what, here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's what I'm going to tell you. I know that I've let you both down, but I thought you were just kidding. No, yeah, I I'm thought not. you were joking too. I'm not. So so I am dead serious when I say that I was in and out of my house in probably about five minutes, and about four of that was my wife telling me what I needed to be doing. <laughs> and so uh, you know my mind was not in the right place to be fair, and I was really rushed over because I was so excited to see the setup process of this whole podcast bit, right? And so. So I'm literally open the fridge, grab a bottle of water, and right there on the top shelf is a pint of apple pie moonshine. And I thought, oh my gosh, I got to bring something. Swing. Let me grab this and throw it in my backpack, and I'll take it with me. And I, here's here's one thing. Got to give me some tiny inkling bit of credit here. I'm going to give you credit. Yeah. It's okay. You could have just brought water, but that, I could I could have just brought water. <laughs> I could have also brought Tennessee whiskey, right? Yeah. It could have been okay, worse. Okay, all right. Let's have the moonshine. <laughs> Well, just just so you know, and, and and for the people listening out there, so my family um, history kind of is is kind of steeped in the bourbon, the legal bourbon side of the world. Um, but oddly enough, my uh, my wife's family is a little bit uh, steeped in the moonshine industry. That, you know, so a lot of them come from from that culture of, of making moonshine, and so uh, it's very interesting uh, the dynamic that we have sometimes, but but this comes straight from one of them, and I think that they, at some point, are maybe third or fourth generation shiners, and so a lot of times it's really, really, really good, and and I know it doesn't go really great with a bourbon podcast, but but either way, you uh, know, it's the origination. I cannot wait to try it. I just I wish you had brought some vanilla ice cream. Perry, because I like my apple pie moonshine. Oh my gosh, all Perry! Mode. Our freezer is a little empty, right? <sighs> so, sorry. <laughs> Do you have any bomb pops? Because apparently, I learned in Florida that you can make cocktails with bomb pops. What do you mean? Yeah, you, you know, know the, the, rock, the the red, white, and blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Popsicles? No, I'm familiar. Yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah. But yeah. I, I'm confused about the cocktail aspect. How you're making well, a cocktail? Well, by with a bomb cocktail, pop. I mean you stick your popsicle down in a glass of vodka, and that is now a drink. <sighs> Yeah. You know, us millennials are really being creative these days. Yeah. Yeah. Really creative. I, I I'm getting like, a headache and yeah. it's not from the bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Who's oh my excited? God. I, oh God. That looks like it has like chunks of apple pie in the bottom. That looks like when you leave a glass of bourbon out overnight. Yeah. And yeah. all the alcohol is evaporated it's and all cloudy. you have is the, the barrel residue. I have left. some 1968 early times that looks just like that and I'm afraid to open it. Yeah. Don't be scared. The only scary part of this drink, and I'm not joking with you, is that it doesn't even taste like alcohol. It just literally tastes like apple and cinnamon. And so you got to be really careful because this is one of those that'll bite you. What? Hey, CJ, what is... you remember that time you got roofied on a podcast? <laughs> If you thought that that, uh, that win at Florida video was bad, <laughs> you wait till he gets done swigging this. We're going we streaking do. in the quad. I just want to know what <laughs> apple oh, pie That's actually really good. I want to know what apple pie moonshine's like out of a clean Karen. <laughs> do it. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to chug it? Honestly, no, I've got to admit. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swig it. Yeah. I gotta admit that's good. So, is there cinnamon cinnamon in that? Yeah, yeah. Cinnamon's a big part of cinnamon's it. Cinnamon's hard to say. Yeah, after yeah, yeah. A few of those. After a few of these, especially if you swig it a couple times, you won't ever be able to say it again. Wow, that, that's, that's pretty good, right? That's really good. I'm not gonna lie. Oh snap! <laughs> yeah, that's that's the scary part of 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 this moonshine. Is it is that they literally are so good at making it that it, you don't even see it coming. It, you know, most moonshines you have, you know, really hits you hard up front. Do you have an idea of the proof on that? Um, I, I don't off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> One hundred and eighty-three. Uh, but it, I'm sure it's up there. I, I'm sure yeah. it's up there. Yeah. But. What's that? This is a. Uh, I, I figured we'd come back to, to bourbon for the end of the show. Right. Um, this is last year's release of E.H. Taylor Barrel Proof. Sounds like a perfect follow-up. It doesn't it? <laughs> moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we went... What was... Uh, was Maker's... Uh, that Maker's Private the one before the, the moonshine? Uh, no. The, what was the one right No, yeah, that? we did Maker's oh, Private. No, the no, no, one. We, we did the, yeah, we did the 80, the 1980. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, right. so, I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, we've went, we went, well, how big was the, uh, the Maker's Private? Was that what? Oh, it was 108. 108. 108. So what, 108, 101, and then God knows what Almost that moonshine one, yeah, was. Yeah, and now and then, 130. And now 130. So, <laughs> you know, seems, we're trying to make memories. Seems reasonable. 
make memories or totally erase <laughs> them. Who's to say? Who's to say? But I would love to hear from people if you have been on the trail, what have been some of your favorite stops, favorite memories that you've made, all that. And, you know, I will, I will also put a link in the description of this episode to the <laughs> Distilled Experiences website um, if people are interested in checking that out. We'd love to have you along. Yeah, it's a great time. Great. Yeah, and, We'd love like, to any of the any of the three of us would be great tour guides. Yeah, absolutely. We we absolutely. have a lot of uh, we have a lot of fun. Like I don't know what what other companies do or what kind of experience they produce, but um, I like ours. We get a lot of good feedback, and um, I, I think it's a good way to experience the trail, especially if you've never seen it before. There's some. Yeah, there's some good education between stops, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and real quick before we, we move we move on, I, I am interested in hearing um, from you two. What's your favorite place to tour? Like when, when if you could, the ones you've toured before, obviously there's some out there that you haven't been to before, but out of all the ones that you've personally toured through, uh, what's your favorite? I've done multiple different tours at Buffalo Trace. Uh, there's just the standard one. There's the behind the scenes. There's the... Uh, the Bourbon Which is Pond the Trace, Pay. Trace Tour, and then the Hard Hat is the Behind the Scenes, and then the E.H. Taylor Tour is yeah. the... Yeah. Let um, me throw in there, I've also done the Ghost Tour on Halloween, which is ooh, pretty is badass. That awesome? ooh, that yeah. Would be. yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, all three of those are great. I think that the Hard Hat and the the E.H. Taylor Tours are phenomenal. Makers has just one of the most beautiful campuses out there. Even if you go and do their, their tour just to see... The grounds there. I think that's totally worth it. Wild Turkey is pretty amazing. It is. It is. Yeah. They do a fantastic job of, of, of showing the whole process. And they and they really, the people there are so down to earth. Yeah. And it's they are. Fantastic. Yeah. So <clears throat> for me, um, I mentioned that I'm a history buff. So I love Buffalo Trace because there's just so much there. But I will tell you my favorite tour hadn't been brought up. It only happens the first two Saturdays of December, and that's the Christmas tour at Maker's Mark. Yeah, the yeah. candlelight tour. Yeah, candlelight tour. It's self guided. Uh, you just get to kind of wander around the property at night. They have like uh, bourbon cider and bourbon balls, or hot apple cider and bourbon balls on the porch. Bill Samuels Jr. is normally hanging around. You can dip your own bottle, the holiday bottle. Um, it is. It's very, very unique, and it's probably one of my favorite experiences in Bourbon, period, to go down there for that. I've been on a lot of tours. <laughs> <laughs> um, Understandably so. Yeah, um, but, you know, so I won't get into, um, into like, the, the one-offs or the small ones, because you guys have already mentioned some of the best on that, um, but I, I just can't. Um, keep my myself back from just saying that the castle and key provides if you're just talking about a walk in get a ticket for a tour and take off uh there's not many out there that that even hold a light to what they're doing out there they have really from the beginning crafted something um from beginning to end with a lot of thought um and a lot of intent and so you know, just, uh, you know, quick examples, things like the fact that it's not a one guide tour. There's two guides on mm-hmm. every single tour so that the, the the main lead can can guide. And, but the thing <clears throat> is, is that so many people have questions right all the time. And those questions hold the show up. And so what they do is most distilleries will, will shrink the tour down because they expect those questions and the timing needs to be right. Well, with them, they say, okay, we'll just put two guides on this. One will continue moving. And then if you have any questions, just go to the one in the back and the, and the one in the back will take care of it. And the coolest part of that is is that the one in the back always has a headpiece in and so if they don't know the answer that headpiece is connected to the highest distillers the highest administration in the whole distillery so the the question will get answered immediately by the authority on that subject yeah. and so you're going to get the best answer possible all the time and not only just that but but if you've not been to those grounds before the fact that it looks like a world war ii bomb site and it's a working distillery at the same exact time uh is fabulous and it's just so beautiful and it's photo- about as photogenic as you could possibly yeah. get that <clears throat> and and i'm not just saying this this is feedback i've gotten from people in my life that have gone out there 
uh, and I don't disagree with it, is that that property is the most amazing property on uh, in Kentucky as far as the distilleries go. Um, and what they chose not to fix mm. is part of what makes it yeah. even cooler. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, they're just like, no, you know, because a lot of places would be like, well, we have to tear that down and we have to make it look right. And they've said, no, we're going to, you know, we're going to create a botanical garden here for our mm-hmm. gin. And mm-hmm. I'm not a gin drinker, but their gin is it's really, really good. good. Yep. And uh, just so you all know, the fall release on that gin is coming very soon, Ooh. I hear. So I, this I, might be a podcast yeah, exclusive. Right? right. It's going to be really, really as good. As long as so. we're talking about yeah. it, can we just have one cheers for Marianne? Uh, uh, cheers to Marianne. Yeah, a fantastic talent. And, and I can't wait to see what she does. No doubt she's going to be successful, but yeah. it still hurts a little bit. By the way, first thing that I, um, wow, 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 wow. Sorry to, that that bourbon literally was so good that it stopped me mid sentence. That was uh, that E. H. Taylor bar- barrel proof. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Woo. Hallelujah. So, uh, <laughs> so, so today, um, just just one more quick thing about Castle and Key. So I was there today. And uh, and I and I decided to go out with a group and and, and just kind of you know explore the. Pro- it's always fun walking around, even if you're not learning something, even if you're not even listening. If I'm just trailing behind, just being able to walk around the property is something really cool. But um, but I got in a conversation with the secondary guy, and she was like, "Oh, did you know how much they were producing here when national you know when national was running their whiskey out of there?" Uh, and I was like, "No, I don't. I don't think I've ever." been told that they were making a thousand barrels a day oh my gosh a thousand <laughs> barrels a day and so i was like what does that even mean when it comes to the equipment that it would have taken to do this and so we get talking about it and she had seen this uh kind of laying in the brush and and kind of looked at it and asked some questions i guess either way out by warehouse b you know the really long Rick House at the end of the property there. Uh, so if you're walking towards it to the left, you, you know that big water tower that sits there? Yeah. So, yeah. so back behind that, kind of uh, you know, uh, across from that warehouse there, uh, sitting back just a little bit in the brush, if you look, there's, there's, there's definitely a hole there to look if you want to. And you look through there, and it's their old column still. Wow. And oh my gosh. I'm not even joking with you when I say that she told me the dimensions of it, it was a 72-inch column still. It looked, I mean, you could have walked through it. You could have stood, I mean, because it was on its side, and you and the plates are still in it, and you can see the plates, but literally you could have stood up and walked straight through it. It was that big, and it was the most, it was the most insane thing I've ever seen, I feel like, wow. when it comes to a column still, just sitting out in the, well, in the wilderness. We so- should totally steal it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to steal the Declaration of Independence, but it's a column still. That is something that I wish that Mary Ann had pointed out to me when I did my episode with her. Oh my gosh, yeah. I wish I had known that. Oh, but yeah. that is that is so. Also, for perspective, Limestone Branch makes two barrels of bourbon a day. Man, God. <laughs> yeah, think about that. My in 2019, gosh. and this is what in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, National a was making time. a thousand thousand barrels a day out of that joint. Man, wow. it was just it's just incredible. When I saw that, I was like, I've, I've just never seen. Uh, I, I don't even I don't know of any column stills that that breach six feet and that are that are operating today um, in Kentucky that I know of. I mean, I don't know what Jim Beam's producing. I don't know that the size of their still. Um, uh, but see, Jim Beam's special because they have multiple distillery sites. Exactly. But do the, but do, do any of their sites have a still that that it's is that? I don't size? know if it's that big, but I I'm just thinking, <clears throat> even if they don't have seventy two inch steel stills. They could still have two 36 inch stills. Oh, definitely. You definitely. know, so they could be matching that or right. three, three of that size or whatever. Well, well, I was talking more about just the dramatic size of the oh, single yeah, 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 steel. Yeah. That was more, yeah, less about, sure. you know, it was just to see, uh, you know, an individual steel at that size mm-hmm. uh, was really kind of a shock and all moment. Even for someone that's, you know, constantly in the industry, you know, day in and day out, that was still a really shocking moment to see that. I think that's as good a place as any to kind of start wrapping things up. I feel but shocked. I am an awe. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of shock and awe, right? 
But we're not done just yet. We do have another segment before we get out of here. And that is our recommendation segment called Tips and Bits. Mm. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be bourbon. If there's been something you've been watching, listening to, enjoying, whatever recently, feel free to recommend it. So for Tips and Bits, I'm going to go a little bit off of the bourbon uh, subject and talk about streaming services. Because this is important to me. And I know them all. All. This sounds like you're about to give me a pitch for like either multi-level no, no, marketing no, no. or... No, uh, no, 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 no. So I will give you an anti-pitch for anything that involves a dish that doesn't have cheese on it uh, or or cable. Because, I, look, I there is no way to put this other than they all blow. They all blow. Yeah. Now, then what you have to do, if you have... Good internet and get Metronet if you have the ability to get Metronet Um, because it's faster and cheaper and it's not Spectrum. Um, (laughs) Amen to that. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been a DirecTV Now subscriber for quite some time. It's great on Apple TV. There's still some glitches, Um, but the DVR is not up to speed. Even I'm two years in. So... I've decided that I need to start advocating for some of the other services. Sling is really good, but doesn't have locals. Okay. You have to switch to your antenna, which that's too much work. Um, Hitting that button is a lot of work. There's, I'm, it's a whole button. <laughs> and then uh, Hulu, Hulu Live TV is great. I love it. That's what we have. You know, but here's what you don't know. Maybe you do know. When you travel, you're screwed. Oh, yeah, because you're not on your home network. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So forget that. Now, it's no, been a long time, time, but my first foray into that was PS View, and that was the same thing. You had to be on your home network. Wow. Like, you couldn't even go to your girlfriend's house or your wife's house. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and be on the network, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I've sorry. decided that <laughs> I've decided that I'm going to throw all of my weight and there's a little bit behind YouTube TV. You get your locals, you get unlimited DVR, and if you tie into like I know you're good friends with Chad and Sarah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the other stuff you watch kind of gets like integrated into your live TV and it's just like kind of awesome. one place to go. Um and I have to so rethink things now. I, 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 I never, well, just I've look at do the before. seven day trial, right? Okay. So while you're drinking your bourbon and you want to not have sucky dish or sucky cable, and um, you know, Directv now is owned by AT and T. It's a little bit corporate for me. I just can't do it. Hulu won't let me travel. Can't do that. So I'm gonna go in with YouTube TV. That's your tips and bits. Okay, I could get on board with that. All right. That's fair. That's Nate. fair. I think that, uh, I think for me, uh, I I have nothing but this past vacation that I just got off of on my mind. I really I really can't get off of it. And by the way, no one goes to Nova Scotia. Here's the deal. If you don't want to <laughs> knock it till you try it, that's the deal with Nova Scotia. So actually, Nova Scotia has been on a, uh, a bucket list of mine for a long time, oddly enough. Uh, I know that's quite weird for most people, but... What weird alternate dimension did yeah, we just I'm slip a, into? Let's go as far north as possible. Oh, there's there's much farther expanses north than that, my friend. Uh, but Nova Scotia on Not the... my world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I went to a, the Arctic Circle one time on a, on a puddle jumper, and I thought that I was going to die before I made it there. But once I did, and I realized that every one of them caught all their food out of the, uh, the stream that came out of the ocean on these like turn wheel bits and I realized that everything was based on that life I was like there's some places out so here so you were in a village of yetis literally and not the cups I need a <laughs> nap after that sentence <laughs> that was like the beginning of a country song I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry 90s. I don't mean to crap all over your tips and bits no Go it's ahead. okay it's okay so um so 
I went to I went to Canada, all right, and I started in um, I started actually out of Detroit and, and then went up the St. Lawrence River uh, all the way up to Nova Scotia. And you got eighteen more turkey decanters for five bucks. <laughs> yes, <a> <laughs> I did, and <laughs> and it was fantastic. Actually, oddly enough, I went into their uh, kind of like a state run liquor store that they got up there, and uh, and I brought back I don't know something like eighteen Blantons or something like that because they Ooh. were just on the shelves like nothing, and uh, and so I thought. Well, you know, just get them while I can. Uh, but either way, uh, first off, Canada uh, in the summer, legit. I probably would never even try it out in the winter. Uh, but in the summer, it is super legit. I know why you guys were having a heat wave down here. It was a, oh, it was a beautiful, crisp 74 to 82 every single day with no humidity. And so I'm not going to argue that. And so what my tip is, is to think about going north. It's just in the summer months, just in the summer months. And so let me tell you this right now. Uh, first off, the Kingston area around, it's called Thousand Islands. But my tip is, is to, uh, is, is if you ever get a chance, go up there, um, go to that Kingston area. Uh, Thousand Islands. Check it out. The, one of the coolest things I've ever seen when I was driving by, they have, uh, it literally is like a thousand islands out in the middle of this river. And what's really cool is that even the smallest of islands, that one of them couldn't have been bigger than like five feet or something like that. Because wow. literally what they did is they built this small house on it, uh, but it was on a raft system that was attached to the rock. And so literally when you That's looked wild. at it from the road, I'm not even joking with you, the, from the road, it looked like the house was sitting on the water. Water, like the water was the foundation. There was nothing below really? it. It was right to the, and it was just like a house you would see in a typical neighborhood. It wasn't any kind of special house. It was just a typical house, and it literally set completely flush with the water, and it was absolutely it blew my mind. As a mortgage professional, I feel like the flood insurance would be really expensive for that. It, it probably would. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that it was it was an amazing sight to see. Uh, and, and then I wish I would have been able to see the guy pull up to the house in the boat, you know, like, and just like dock at his back door <laughs> and then, and then roll into the house, I guess that would have been really cool. Uh, but either way, my tip was to eventually get yourself to Nova Scotia. And, and here's the deal. Has have either one of you seen Oak Island, the curse of Oak Island off Hulu? No, no. no. Okay. So no. I'm a, I, I like those kind Sorry. of like weird historical based kind of like drama series. So it's really historically based and it's, it's basically these guys trying to find this buried treasure on an island in Nova Scotia. And so, uh, you know, we went around there and the whole south side of Nova Scotia, if you didn't know this, there's, it's like separated uh, in half, basically. There's a northern part that's like an island in a way and then there's a southern part that's like the lowlands and the highlands literally is like the highlands of Scotland. Looks just like it. And so the tip is go to Cape Breton. That's what it's called, Cape Breton. Uh, and it might be one of the most fantastic places that I've been from a national park standpoint. It's unbelievable. And if you go in July, which is hands down the best time to go because it's actually warm uh, or warm-ish, <laughs> uh, what was really neat is there's this place called Meat Cove. And no, like M-E-A-T, like Meat Cove. I was going to say, I yeah. thought you said Meat Cove, but then you did. It really it really that. is called Meat Cove. Uh, I, I was really worried about... What do they, they have the name, there, Nate? Where they got the name, but... Uh... I have always wanted to go to Canada. Yeah. I mean, legitimately, like, there are some beautiful places up there that I would love to visit. So to finally get through my tips and bits, the last <laughs> bit of it was, is that in July, you go up to Cape Breton, and up there, if you didn't know it already, the whales come in they migrate into that uh tip of that saint lawrence river there so there were belugas and humpback whales there were uh you know many varieties and literally from the coast like you can camp or you can stay at a hotel or whatever but you can stay there and literally if you outlook over you know you look over that northern cove you can see the whales coming into the cove you're literally like whale watching from a campsite so for me uh at night you know i'd start a fire i'm out looking over like a sunset at Cape Breton and these whales are coming in. I've got a glass of whiskey in the hand. I don't, I don't really know a better place to spend an evening than that right there. And so that is my tip is to make yourself up to Nova Scotia, take it, take a risk in life and go North uh, instead of South and, and try it out. I, when you put it that way, I mean, I, I think I might yeah, have to. I can't even be a smart ass about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. But, but seriously, we tell people to try different things in bourbon, right? Oh yeah. So, yeah, I, I get it, but it would have to be summer. 100%. Has There's no way summer. I would go any other time. Yeah. I, I, we stayed in an Airbnb, uh, just like a room, not not even a whole place. We just stayed in a room. And uh, we got in there, and the two people that we stayed with, no joke, they used to own a tour company in Nova Scotia. 
right? Small world. And so I, notes. It, yeah, right, exactly. So we're just <laughs> me and the dude ended up staying up forever one night just chatting about all that all that kind of stuff. And he was telling me he was like, you know, from I, I think he I think he said May to uh, end of October that they stay there and then they kind of go south after that because they said it's literally almost unbearable. I how bad it, it is. Well, my tips and bits this week uh, are in the form of music. I have been on a bit of a Tyler Childers kick recently. Ooh, oh, like he's um, fantastic. He is incredible. But I also recently discovered uh, a semi-new artist. His name's Ariel Posen. I think I'm saying his name right. He is maybe my new favorite modern guitar player uh, absolutely fantastic so like um, blues guitar or yeah, what, what kind of it's idea? it's blues with um hints of like soulfulness to it there's some classic rock vibe to it as well um i'll i'll, I'll post a link in the description of the episode too for people to find him but man he's so good he popped up on instagram for me one day and i just could not stop listening to him I think he's just a phenomenal guitar player. He's he's kind of in that same vein as like the bluesy side of John Mayer, um, but his guitar playing is a little bit more aggressive, kind of Stevie Ray Vaughan ish, hmm. I would say. So, do you do you have a favorite song so far? Um, Angeline is his most recent song that uh, came out and is really really good. Um, she knows is another fantastic song. But I want people to experience. Yeah, this absolutely, artist. absolutely. I just yeah. didn't know where I needed but, to start. There, you know, obviously, there's so many songs. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. Thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode. I've had a whole heck of a lot of fun. I guess I'll have you guys back on sometime. If you, yeah, it's been great. Be Dude, that's at so. your own risk. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has been cool, though. I, I like this. Uh, there's. This is what I do when I'm just out hanging out at Whiskey Bear or OBC or wherever. You just sit and talk to people, and it's been great. Now you get to listen back to it. Yeah. I'm afraid yeah. to listen. I know, right? I don't want to listen. I probably won't. Uh, <laughs> but it, it really is about the communion, right? It's really fun yeah. just to sit down here with uh, with some Absolutely. friends and, and share a couple of drinks and just chat about stuff that you're interested in. There, there's nothing nothing better. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys again so much for being here. Thanks on. for having us. Thank, thank you, you all so much for listening as well. Is there anywhere on social media that people can find either of you if they would like to do that oh you go CJ. well uh <laughs> so you, you can find uh you can find the the company stuff at distilled experiences um both on instagram and on facebook uh instagram is definitely the um the better of the two only because uh what we do is a little bit better from a visual standpoint um but uh but yeah and if, and if you're interested in in nova scotia pictures and, and and things about meat cove uh feel free to you can also uh you know follow my personal instagram page dj nate uh as far as finding me on social media i mean um i do some stuff for work um uh, you know, I'm a mortgage professional so you can find me at american financial network which is afn corp.com slash cj cunningham fine yeah are we allowed to do commercial stuff here i don't yeah, know sure go for it uh otherwise just find me on facebook that's where i spend a lot of my time and we have fun and um and that's it yeah Good. i am at p raider 1492 on instagram and twitter if you'd like to give me a follow there the show you can follow at my bourbon pod on instagram facebook and twitter Love to have you along in the community. Please give us a five-star rate and review on iTunes. That really does help us out. Get more people seeing the show and listening to it. We always want new people to check it out. It's really important. You can head to bourbonshop.threadless.com where we have all of our apparel and merch. There's a free shipping deal going on right now. If you are not yet, you can become a part of our Facebook group. This is my bourbon group. Is all you have to search for on Facebook. There's just a couple questions for you to answer, and we'll be happy to let you in. And then finally, you can head to patreon.com slash mybourbonpodcast for as little as a dollar a month. You can support the show. You get awesome things like bonus episodes. You get to be a part of hangouts with some of the other listeners of the show, bonus live streams, all sorts of awesome stuff. Again, that's patreon.com slash mybourbonpodcast. We would love for you to be a part of the Patreon community. Thank you again to Nate and CJ for being on the show. Guys, it's been a whole lot of fun. Really appreciate it, man. It's been a great time. Yeah, me too. It was a blast. Great. I will see you all next week, but until then, I'm Perry, and this is my Bourbon Podcast.